Um, so thank you everybody for being here. I okay, we haven't started yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, we haven't started in the sense that I will briefly introduce you. So. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you were going to do that. And, oh, sure. I mean, we, we're not very formal, but no you know, expectations really... about that at all. Okay. okay. All thank right. you, Dad. All right. Okay. Uh, so we're going to make a start. I hope everybody is ready. It's most importantly, Celia. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Gad Human, and I'm one of the organizers of the webinar, along with uh, Steve Cushion and uh, Kate Quinn. And it's, uh, as you may have gathered since we've been chatting for a while, it's a great personal pleasure to welcome Celia Naylor uh, to the seminar stroke webinar, if you like. Uh, she is a professor of Afri Africana Studies and still chair of the Africana Studies Department uh, at Barnard College, which is, of course, part of Columbia. Um, her recent book, uh, Unsilencing Slavery, which I can highly recommend, is the basis uh, for her presentation today. Uh, the subtitle of her um, of, of the book and of the presentation is Telling Truth About Rose Hall Plantation. And uh, I would just add a personal note that on Celia's urging, I revisited, uh, I revisited um, Rose Hall um, less than a couple of weeks ago, in fact, um, and was even more horrified than the first time. But we will discuss that. Uh, we'll follow the usual drill. Uh, Celia will speak for around 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A. So I hope that people will store up their questions, and I will then pass over, or now pass over to Celia. Wonderful, thank you so much, Gad, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, first, of course, um, thank you, Professor Human, for inviting me to this seminar. Um, we were talking at the very beginning that um, Gad and I have interacted at a couple of different conferences, Puerto Rico, Cuba, maybe some other ones too. Um, and so it's uh, it's been wonderful to interact with him uh, in person. Um, and we've had, as we just said, very pleasant conversations, um, ongoing conversations, actually. So it's a pleasure to be here and to be invited. Um, I'm also really thankful and grateful for those who were organizers of the event itself, who helped in any small or, or large way to, to make this event possible. So thank you as well. And then to all of you for being here. So um, really appreciate you taking time out of your early evening. Uh, it's afternoon for me, but early evening for you to, to join in this event. So as Gad said, I've been asked to speak for about 30 minutes. Um, and it should be about that. I, I'm going to try to be good about that. It might go over to 32 or 33, but you will, you will allow me that. Um, so I wasn't sure, and I meant to ask you, Gad, and I forgot about that, uh, to ask whether there might be some who may have read parts of the book um, and others who may not have. So I assumed that most would not have read the book, and there might be a few who um, have read parts of it, or at least a description about it, right? So I'm reading mostly from the introduction um, to the book. And uh, I think what I will see at the end, whether you think so as well, but I think it provides a, a good overview of uh, the book itself, as well as the purpose of it. Um, and I am someone who's very committed to deciding uh, about a purpose before, during, and after anything um, that I agree to do. Um, so hopefully it'll be 30. Gad, if you could let me know when we get to 30, um, just so I can have a sense of that too, that would be great. Um, I also mentioned to Gad, I've been in uh, morning meetings about protests here um, on campus. This is part of the administrative um, opportunities that I have uh, on campus. And uh, so I'm hoping my voice will hold out. Um, I have some water, so I may need to, to do that, but just to let you know ahead of time. All right. In the summer of 2013, I decided to take my daughter, IMB, to Jamaica for her first visit. I was born in Jamaica and I ra and raised there until I was 10. So most of my stories about the island had been childhood tales. 
IMB was on the verge of teendom, willing and oh so ready to travel internationally with me. And I felt it was important for her to have a better sense of this part of her family's history. Montego Bay, often referred to as Mo Bay, was our destination. And though we visited different sites, our main excursion was to the Rose Hall Great House. I admit I mentioned to IMB that Rose Hall was a historic place. And to grab her attention, I noted that when I was a child, I had learned that it was a ghost house. That, of course, intrigued her. As a child, I had also been captivated by duppy stories, duppy meaning ghost stories. However, I must confess that this was my first time on the tour. Growing up in Kingston, I had heard fleeting, disjointed stories of Annie Palmer, the White Witch of Rose Hall, but I had never visited Rose Hall with my family or on my own. Primarily because of Herbert G. Delissa's 1929 novel entitled The White Witch of Rose Hall, Annie Palmer is remembered as a particularly notorious mistress whose lovers included both Englishmen and men enslaved on her plantation. Most stories emphasize her supposed numerous, heinous, and supernatural deeds. The murder of three British husbands, her excessively brutal treatment of the persons enslaved on her plantation, and as legend goes, her ghost haunting of the Rose Hall Great House and grounds today. Indeed, as the novel and contemporary Rose Hall Great House tours highlight, Annie Palmer's life supposedly ended tragically when her previously enslaved lover, Taku, killed her as an act of revenge for her lethal curse on his granddaughter, Millicent. These details of Annie Palmer's legend have circulated widely in Jamaica and throughout the world. Every year, more than 100,000 people visit Rose Hall. They have shared pictures and stories, keeping the legend alive into the present day. As IMB and I followed the tour guide, moving from one room to the next, I became increasingly incensed by how much the tour focused entirely on Annie Palmer and her malevolent actions as the White Witch of Rose Hall. IMB and the other visitors, however, were entirely enthralled by it, especially the multiple attempts to scare us with startling sounds and sudden movements. Even to this day, after many visits to Jamaica, when asked about her first visit, the Rose Hall tour remains IMB's favorite part of the trip. As I walked away from my first tour of the Rose Hall Great House, however, the most pressing feeling that lingered for me was the disturbing absence of any essential information about slavery or the lives of enslaved persons at Rose Hall. I was troubled by the conscious decisions made to use this plantation site to mesmerize and entertain to avoid the reality of the trepidation, terror and trauma of previously enslaved persons on these grounds. I was troubled by how the fabricated stories of Annie Palmer as the White Witch provided an easy channel for white visitors and everyone else to circumvent, circumvent the violences of slavery, offered them safe passage to enter the realm of slavery without any critical engagement and allowed them to be apparently freed from the remnants of slavery's brutality and the suffering it caused. I was troubled by the pleasurable experiences of those visitors and by the fact that at the end, many conveyed how much they appreciated all the history presented throughout the tour. I was troubled by the ways in which the Jamaican tour guides, primarily women, were also seemingly enticed and entranced by the stories they told over and over again about the sexual and murderous exploits of Annie Palmer, without any stories about the women who were enslaved there, women who could have been 
their ancestors. I was troubled by my own state of being during and after the tour, simultaneously awake, or in common parlance, woke, aware of and agitated by the silences, gaps, and inaccuracies regarding enslaved persons and slavery itself. The choreography of these myths and silences in the Rose Hall tours materialized from Herbert G. Delissa's 1929 novel. Due to limited historical and factual information about Annie Palmer, Delissa utilized the fertile ground of these historical gaps to concoct this legend about a white witch. As a result, the only, and I repeat only, historical facts included in Delissa's novel and in the Rose Hall tours are that a woman named Annie Palmer lived at Rose Hall between 1820 and 1830, and that she was the white mistress during those years. All other details about Annie Palmer described in, the, in Delissa's novel and the tours are entirely fictional, including, but not limited to, the information about Annie Palmer's and her parents' connections and time spent in Haiti, Annie Palmer being raised by a voodoo priestess in Haiti, Annie Palmer's marriage to three Englishmen, her murdering these three husbands, and her being killed by a previously enslaved man named Taku during a slave revolt. In addition to these fictional depictions of Annie Palmer in the novel and the tours, the Great House tours also conclude at what is supposed to be Annie Palmer's final resting place. <clears throat> Whether the remains of any person are in the coffin is unclear, but if there are any, they do not belong to Annie Palmer. Her final resting place is in the Montego Bay churchyard, though her grave is not, her grave is not identified or marked in any way. In a similar vein, visitors mistakenly assume that the Rose Hall Great House is a museum. Simply stated, it is not a museum. Instead, the Rose Hall Great House operates as a tourist site with fictional information presented as the history of the site. <clears throat> Almost two years after that first tour, I vacillated between thoughts of how someone should write about this and, well, how I should write about this. Though clearly perturbed by the tour's narrative and the responses of other visitors, I walked away not haunted by the fabricated ghost of Annie Palmer. Instead, I was haunted by those who had an actual historical right to haunt this venue, the enslaved people who labored at Rose Hall and directly experienced the horrors of bondage. As I ruminated about what exactly I would explore about Rose Hall, it became quite obvious that this would not be a traditional history book. Telling truths about slavery demands not only unearthing enslaved persons' experiences out of limited archival records, but also unveiling the afterlives of slavery embodied in the novel and the tours. Even after I decided to include these aspects in one book, I also recognized that the book would not be sufficient to demonstrate to a larger audience in some small measure the intricacies and nuances of the interlocking lives of enslaved persons. Although I usually describe myself as a 20th century techie, early on I imagined a website that would offer another avenue, another form to present these enslaved persons to counter the dominant master mistress narrative in the official Rose Hall Great House website. And I'll show you that um, afterwards um, when we're all done. It was crucial to move the enslaved people from the margin to the center of this history. I wanted, to in, I wanted to provide this information in an online format, one that would give visitors an opportunity to review selected historical documents about this plantation. 
And really the purpose of it was to name as many of the enslaved persons as I could on that website, right? So that their names would be front and center. The project engages in the critical process of what Christina Sharp refers to as wake work. It is to begin to name those enslaved who have been unremembered and unmemorialized. It is to begin to reconstruct stories buried and deemed unworthy of telling and retelling. It is to begin to reimagine the struggles, suffering and sanctity of people enslaved, though not entirely dehumanized. It is to begin to question the afterlife of slavery that is Rose Hall in content and in form. And it is to begin to ask what and who survive at Rose Hall in the mythical ghost haunting of a white witch, the pretense of memorialization and the facade of slavery. In the literary and popular reincarnations of Annie Palmer in Delissa's novel, and in the contemporary tours, what and who serve as witnesses? What and who are being witnessed? And what and who are being remembered and forgotten for what purposes related to the telling of the past, the living in the, <clears throat> the, living in the present, and the imaginings of the future? <clears throat> Certainly, over the past several years, and in some select cases, even decades, there have been efforts at plantation sites in the U.S., including Thomas Jefferson's Monticello and George Washington's Mount Vernon, to present more information about enslaved persons during plantation tours and in the materials at the sites themselves. The official Rose Hall website, however, revolves around the myth of Annie Palmer. That focus extends into tours as Annie Palmer's experiences, voice and presence remain pivotal throughout the tours, while enslaved women's experiences, voices and presence are neglected, ignored and silenced. Yet, it is not that these tours entirely discount the presence of enslaved women. At random moments during the tour, a couple of black women appeared seemingly out of nowhere, acting as ghosts of enslaved women engaged in household duties. They were dressed completely in white and their faces were powdered white as well. They expressed no words or utterances at any point in their performance. What were we to make of their ghostly appearances? How did their liminality function as a witness to slavery's past without personifying and demonstrating the horrors of bondage? How did their bodies simultaneously represent a palpable corporeal marker for slavery while also serving as neutralized, anesthetized tourist props? Why are the names of enslaved women and their actual lived experiences secretly cast into the shadows of the Rose Hall Great House. I decided to research Rose Hall because of its historic importance and its contemporary usage. This critical interdisciplinary exa examination of the contemporary tours at Rose Hall also includes an analysis of the primary source of the tours, of the legend itself, the Lisser's 1929 novel. By utilizing Rose, Rose Hall as a case study, my intentions and perhaps interventions are the particular voices and silences in the daily tours as a lens through which to understand how representations at Rose Hall Great House and other such sites of slavery are neither innocuous nor incidental. Even though slavery's ritualized routinized acts of terror and trauma are not presented during the tours, these gaps and silences surrounding the tour, the stories of enslaved persons in these tours today become a contemporary form of perpetual violence, reified and reinscribed at this site of slavery. By focusing on the early 20th, on the early 19th century, 
I have grappled with elements of archival silence and archival violence that Marisa Fuentes highlights in her work. And I have sought to address the gaps, erasures, and silences of Rose Hall that are intricately rooted in the limitations of the archives. In this spirit, I not only illuminate the problematic ways slavery continues to be reconstructed and performed at the Rose Hall Great House tourist site, as symptomatic of a broader amnesia about slavery and enslaved persons of African descent, but also utilize archival materials to name the bondswomen, bondsmen, and bonds children at Rose Hall. To begin to explore and reconstruct aspects of their lived experiences at this particular plantation. The purpose of this microhistory of Rose Hall is to consider multiple lenses to explore both the history and the afterlives of slavery at Rose Hall. Even though the Rose Hall Great House remains a popular tourist site, and even though there is a directly related popular novel published by a prolific Jamaican writer, neither Rose Hall's history as a site of slavery nor the novel related to it has garnered significant scholarly attention. This work centers on revealing the names and selected experiences of the enslaved persons who lived, labored, and whenever possible, loved at Rose Hall. As a result of the looming tale of the white witch, their own names and lives have been cast aside or at times positioned in the background to highlight the myths about Annie Palmer. With the legend and legacy of slave ownership at Rose Hall in mind, my archival investigation concentrates on Rose Hall in the early decades of the 19th century, ending with, ending with the Baptist War, also referred to as the Christmas Rebellion of 1831-1832. Examining these final decades of slavery in Jamaica, I'm especially interested in unveiling the multifaceted aspects of enslaved persons lived experiences at Rose Hall, particularly enslaved women's experiences. I examined the plantation records of Rose Hall during these early decades of the 19th century and reviewed materials on Rose Hall and slavery in Montego Bay, housed right there in England at the National Archives in Kew and the special collections really right there at the UCL library. The archival materials for this period located in Jamaica's National Archives in Spanish Town and the National Library of Jamaica in Kingston provided information about the workings of Rose Hall, the annual crop reports, as well as the triennial lists of returns of slaves. The first slave list for Rose Hall for 1817 was completed the year before the arrival of Annie Palmer's husband, John Rose Palmer. And again, that's her only husband. This list included 79 enslaved males and 73 enslaved females at Rose Hall, a total of 152 enslaved persons. The final triennial slave list of 1832 for Rose Hall notes 51 enslaved males and 61 enslaved females, now a total of 112 enslaved people, again in 1832. Uh, on the website, I actually highlight 208 enslaved persons at Rose Hall between this period, again, from 1817 to 1832. On my initial research trip in July 2014 to Jamaica's National Archives in Spanish Town, while reviewing the selected slave registries there, I encountered a three-volume set of weekly handwritten journal entries entitled The Rose Hall Journal, 1817 to 1832, penned by the white overseers at Rose Hall. The time period of these journal entries coincidentally overlaps with Annie Palmer's time at the plantation from approximately March 1820, when she married John Rose Palmer at Mount Pleasant in Jamaica, until she left Rose Hall 
sometime between 1829 and 1830. Outside of the triennial slave registries providing a census of enslaved people at Rose Hall, including the total number of enslaved females and males with additional notes concerning recent births and deaths on the plantation, the Rose Hall Journal presents the only other extant document revealing aspects of the daily routines at Rose Hall for enslaved persons, as well as events deemed noteworthy on this plantation. In approximately 1,000 handwritten pages, the overseers who penned the Rose Hall Journal recorded information on the daily occurrences at this plantation, categorizing enslaved persons who labored there based on their designated work groups, often referred to as gangs, right, in other documents on planta in plantation records, as well as on their primary jobs and duties on the plantation. For example, field worker, midwife, cook, cooper, carpenter, etc. The overseers also noted on a weekly basis how many enslaved women were pregnant, how many enslaved persons were runaways, invalids, and in the great house. They did not record individual names of enslaved persons in their charting of how many were assigned to which gangs and jobs in a given week. Only the additional brief notations, including references to specific persons who died, enslaved women who gave birth, and individual runaways in terms of when they departed or when they returned or were brought back to Rose Hall and whether they were punished for their actions. In the Rose Hall Journal, there is very little sense of enslaved persons' lives outside of their work positions and related duties. The overseers offered no information about enslaved persons' particular intimate experiences. For example, their individual or, family or familial morning, morning activities and routines before they commenced their respective duties on the plantation. We assume that enslaved women with young children rose early to breastfeed their children and perhaps to carve out time no matter how briefly in the early hours of the morning to commune with partners, friends, and other family members. Unlike other enslaved mothers in nearby or faraway plantations, these enslaved women did not have to serve as wet nurses to Annie Palmer's children, as she and John Rose Palmer did not have any children. However, this fact in and of itself did not necessarily translate to enslaved mothers at Rose Hall receiving preferential treatment or extended time to breastfeed their children in the morning or at any other time of the day or night. As is often the case with plantation records, limited information is offered about the intimate relationships between enslaved persons. For example, in the triennial slave registries, and in the Rose Hall Journal, um, notes about the births of enslaved children on the plantation specifically indicate their respective mothers. However, no biological fathers, whether enslaved or freed black men or white men are included in reference to any of these children. Certainly this reflects the racialized, gendered and class dimensions of a slaveocracy deeply embedded in the juridical doctrine of partus sequitur ventrum. This principle, often referred to just as partus, dictated that the enslaved or free status of a child followed that of their mother. Besides the actual status of enslaved children, such records provide limited insight about the relationships, connections, and tensions between enslaved parents as well as interactions with other members within Rose Hall's enslaved community. What emerges nevertheless in the archival documents is a sense of collective and possibly communal experiences of slavery that included the intergenerational presence of selected families at Rose Hall. The presence of multiple generations coexisting at Rose Hall 
reveals neither a harmonious nor a contentious enslaved community, or even both aspects transpiring there simultaneously over time. The records do not provide explicit descriptions or references to the interactions, friendships, and other relationships between enslaved persons outside of their individual labor routines. The archival sources I utilized are exclusively related to Rose Hall, though there are some references to Palmyra Plantation as well, um, though I don't include Palmyra in, my, in the book. Um, and I do not intend to present any general conclusions about sugar plantations in Jamaica or in the Caribbean more broadly. I was specifically interested in a focus case study on Rose Hall as a way to explore the archival material on this plantation to offer a counter narrative to the myth and legend of the White Witch of Rose Hall. In order to offer some sense of the individual and collective lives of enslaved persons at Rose Hall, I present possible interconnected elements of their lives. I also wanted to contextualize the limited shreds of information provided in the journal with possible questions and scenarios that could deepen readers' understanding of views of enslaved persons beyond simply their names on the pages of a plantation journal. Instead of a day in the life of an enslaved person at Rose Hall, I reveal possible scenarios of enslaved persons' connections and the meanings they may have ascribed to particular events. By doing so, I create potential narratives about their lives to display on the page how to move from bits and fragments of information to possible lenses of understanding. Instead of discussing how we write history with limited archival fragments, I use the early chapters and others in the book as a pedagogical and scholarly demonstration of the actual writing of history based on these archival fragments. This book presents Rose Hall Plantation from three different modes of history making and history telling. The first three chapters center the archival research with historical interjections and I hope interventions and tease out the possible individual and collective lived experiences of enslaved persons at Rose Hall. The fourth chapter focuses on Delissa's historical novel in his creation of the White Witch of Rose Hall myth and examine selected dimensions of his literary imaginings of particular themes and tropes related to bondage and freedom. The fifth chapter examines the histrionic enactment of these topics in Delissa's novel within the contemporary tours at Rose Hall as these tours and weddings create a stream of income for the property owners, an elite white American family based in Delaware in the United States. These three modes of history making and history telling all evolve around the untold interlocking multiple erasures of enslaved women, especially the physical, psychological and sexual violences they endured as well as the specific privileging of white supremacist, imperialist, heterosexist frameworks. Presenting a, a, sorry, presenting a descriptive narrative of the labors of enslaved persons in their various positions on this plantation and extracting additional information from scraps of archival material, material offer some semblance of their lived experiences as human beings and remind all of us, as Catherine Cohen states, quote, of the totality of black subjectivity, end quote. How might they have understood their place, their sense of belonging at Rose Hall? In what ways did they attempt to carve out and reclaim aspects of their humanity by deploying individual and collective acts and processes of resistance? In what instances were they able to create and engage in different manifestations of their sociocultural identities? Can we utilize the records, specifically the Rose Hall Journal, 
as a medium and tool for articulating the experiences of enslaved persons still shrouded in and buried by the legend of the White Witch. Even as the names and experiences of enslaved women, men, and children who labored at Rose Hall remain unspoken, unremembered, and unmemorialized at the present site. During the tours, we do not learn about Penella giving birth to her daughter, Daisy, a few days before Christmas in 1817. Nothing is said about the time when Kate delivered of a stillborn child in August, 1824. And there are no words uttered about the death of Celia's 25-year-old son, Louis, in 1818, when he was run over by a wagon, or when 60-year-old African-born Peachy took her last breath in early March, 1818. Even as the voices of enslaved women, such as Penella, Kate, Celia, and Peachy, remain stifled and silenced in the contemporary tours, even as enslavers of the days of yore denied their maximal humanity, the actual presence and experiences of enslaved women could not be entirely silenced. The first part of this book's title invokes Michel Roth Trio's Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History. And I emphasize the process of, of what I refer to as unsilencing slavery. To be clear, slavery was not a quiet, secretive, or silent institution. Rather, it was resounding and deafening in its private and public, covert and overt demonstrations of pain, power, terror, torture, and trauma. In the notices of slave auctions and sales, in the regular, persistent, and often relentless advertisements <clears throat> for runaway slaves, in the accounting and calculations of the births and deaths of enslaved women, men, and children, in the refusal to grant the most fundamental human rights and civic privileges to enslaved persons, and in the practice of brandings, whippings, maimings, rapes, decapitations, murders, and executions, as well as other forms of emotional, psychological, physical, and spiritual violations and violences. The archives have often functioned and been deployed as historical cover for the depth and breadth of these violences. The first chapter begins lifting the veil and unsilencing slavery at Rose Hall by uncloaking archival records and teasing out individual and collective references to enslaved persons in the journal. Regardless of the systemic processes utilized to control and confine enslaved persons and to silence any actions not in the service of the slaveocracy, enslaved persons permeated and pierced through the archival records of Rose Hall. Beginning in the first chapter, historical speculation serves as a compass and medium of looking at, bearing witness to, listening to, and harnessing what French scholar of Senegalese descent, Mame Fatou Nyang, renders as, quote, the noisy silences that have haunted us and can be as eloquent as the noises, end quote. In the process of unsilencing slavery at Rose Hall, I have purposely integrated unanswerable questions and suppositions about the experiences of enslaved persons who abided there. As you experience the journey of the ideas and narratives within this book, know that these queries serve as a way of broadening, of opening our imaginings and understandings about the vast humanity of enslaved persons at Rose Hall. As one of my mentors and eminent historian, Mary Beth Norton, often reminds her students, and I quote, you can't answer questions you don't ask, end quote. My sole corollary to this would be that even if you cannot answer a question, 
still ask it. There will always be unanswered questions about the lived experiences of enslaved persons. However, the questions we pose and the stories we imagine, consider, and tease out about their lives provide a vital lens in crafting a human and humane story of enslaved persons. History telling itself serves as a modality to express some sense of the fullness of enslaved persons' spirits, the capaciousness of Black humanity, and a reclamation, affirmation, and declaration that enslaved Black lives mattered at Rose Hall and all plantations. The relenting timbers and sounds of, of slavery and its silences permeate the journal. And I ask you to attend to these silences, the noisy silences of dehumanization and marginalization etched throughout the accounting of enslaved persons, laborious routines at Rose Hall. Yet, not all silences were noisy and satiated with contempt and condemnation. Some enslaved people at Rose Hall may have generated, protected, and maintained the silences beyond the recognition and gaze of Rose Hall's enslavers and overseers, beyond the veil of the documents housed in, housed in the archives. Sacred silences not to be shared or detected by those deemed outside the boundaries of this knowledge and community of knowers. Even as the overseers, overseers scribbled their brief notes and numbers in the journal as a way of accounting for the enslaved persons and their respective duties and responsibilities, enslaved persons at Rose Hall were also noting, cherishing, and attending to their individual and collective thoughts, feelings, words, actions, realities, secrets, and dreams of freedom. Thank you so much. Great. That's great, Celia. Uh, I go over thanks it very much. Um, I so I will tell people uh, on Zoom, they all, I think people already know that you can raise your hands or you can ask questions in the chat. Uh, there are already some questions in the chat, but I, I I will usurp my privileged position to say, to ask. Um, so one of the things that I noted when I was there recently uh, was the general acceptance of this, of the myths of Rose Hall among people in, Mora, in Montego Bay. That, that, that when I said this was... Um, I mentioned your book, and I said and they were gobsmack, literally. These are not, these are educated people. And this was a surprise. And these are people in Montego Bay. Now, can you, uh, can you enlighten me on this? Yes. So first, I would say that um, it's important to recognize how much myths and stories and, um, even truths can be manipulated creatively, right? Um, throughout the African diaspora, right? And that oral traditions and oral histories, not only for people of African descent, but certainly for many others as well, um, are particularly prized and honored even in the contemporary day, right? Um, and we And we still, go to and, and move toward oral histories and stories in our own family traditions, right? National narratives, um, and even in global events, right? So I think there's something rich and robust that has, um, it's, that is quite powerful, um, that we often, you know, are drawn toward and attracted to, right? So I think there's that, that is not necessarily specific to Jamaica, but mm -hmm. something specific maybe to human beings. Mm -hmm. And then in Jamaica as well, I think there has been an ongoing, um, ongoing resistance to presenting in public spaces and even in some private spaces, narratives regarding enslaved persons and slavery. Mm -hmm. 
and that even with the ongoing emancipation celebrations, um, you know, every year there are some who write in the Daily Gleaner, the Jamaican major newspaper, about how we should just focus on, Jamaicans should just focus on Independence Day and forget this emancipation part, right? That it's about independence and moving forward and not looking back, right, to slavery. And part of it, as Vereen Shepherd and others, and I mentioned this in the book, in um, the last part of the book, um, that deals more with the contemporary period, right? The part of it is about an ongoing shame that um, permeates so much of Jamaican person's consciousness about what slavery was and uh, a disconnection, right? A conscious and sometimes unconscious disconnection from anything related to slavery that has um, any sort of negative um, purpose or negative grounding, you know, in any way, right? And so this is a way to, Rose Hall represents a way for people not to deal with the shame of slavery, but to more focus on the mythical, the magical elements of storytelling. The problem, one of the problems is that, that those mythical um, creative aspects of storytelling have now been placed as the story and the history itself of slavery and enslaved persons, right? So obviously I don't have anything against mythical storytelling, right? <laughs> um, but the problem is, I and I mentioned this to Gad as, as folks who are joining. So part of the reason that I, one of the many reasons I decided to write something was because in the daytime, there are school children from Montego Bay and you know areas surrounding Montego Bay who go through the tours, right? As a field trip on the history of slavery in Jamaica, right? And so that from for the very young who are being indoctrinated with this, right? And even for myself growing up in Kingston and, and hearing about, you know, um, the White Witch of Rose Hall and believing that person to be an actual person who was a witch, right? Um, who cast her spells, right? That was what I had learned. Um, that it is hard for people to distance themselves from the mythical imaginings to then move toward um, factual historical groundings about torture and trauma, right? Mm -hmm. So much more interesting to think about Annie Palmer as somebody who was involved in, um, you know, orchestrating different kinds of torture for, for people, even though in Delissa's novel as well as in the tours we actually don't hear very much about that right but that's part of the lore is that she was a you know people present her as a very evil woman right we don't know about you know her own particular attributes and characteristics right um psychologically or any other way right but i think gad just to answer your question it's about moving more toward a storytelling that is based on fantasy that can also be absorbed as history that doesn't in any way really deal with the brutalities of slavery and by so doing circumventing the shame of slavery, the supposed shame of slavery in the midst of that. That's what I would offer up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, there are questions uh, in the chat, which I will now, I will just mention in passing that in the tour that I was on recently, she is described as evil. She did watch the beheading of enslaved people. She did put oil in her husband's ears or ugh, terrible things. Now, uh, before so we move to the questions, I just want to, to other questions. I just want to say that part of the reason, though, that she is is described as such is actually, and this comes out even more so in the novel, is because of her connection to Haiti. Of course. Right. And so it's not it's about her, her, the her innocence right as a white woman being compromised right and manipulated as a result of her connection to a voodoo priestess in haiti who supposedly raises her and her connection to haiti itself right that that is what is the the sort of reason the the major reason for the 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 evil that that people describe about yeah, her yeah. right not the, the not innate, but orchestrated right the people don't know that that we're friends and that we could go on talking about this forever yes, yes. and it's not fair so okay, here yes. here's a question from miranda kaufman um a lot of praise for the talk which i totally agree with 
And she, the question she wants to ask, she's visited as well, uh, can you envisage the real history of Rose Hall focused on the lives of enslaved people being told on site in future? I know what the answer to that is, but you have to answer it. Well, well, one, I hold with um, radical hope, um, like I do for the whole world, right? Um, that that change is possible, right? Um, that freedom for everybody is possible, right? And so with that radical hope, I also believe that there could be a change at Rose Hall. And I would say this, that part of the way, if and when I ever have an opportunity um, to talk with a member or members of the Rollins family, that mm -hmm. part of what I will probably do in those conversations is to stress to them that they could actually create, if not, uh, you know, uh, integrating aspects of the real history in this, but an entirely different tour that they could charge more money for, right? <laughs> that, that in fact, they could make more money off of this venture of actually including some of this, right? Um, I think that's probably the only level that I would be able to even partially convince them of making that change, right? That it would be for that purpose. Um, and they might present it if they agreed that they wanted to give more information about enslaved persons at Rose Hall, but certainly other places like Monticello and Mount Vernon have done exactly that right? Mm -hmm. They've created another tour. Well, Whitney Plantation in Louisiana. Whitney Plantation. Yeah, sure. the Whitney Plantation is, is different in that um, it really does try to focus on enslaved persons as the yeah. core of their purpose, <clears throat> right? Yeah. That, that wasn't necessary for Monticello. You know, it took a long time for Monticello and Mount Vernon to stop using the word servants and use the word slaves or enslaved people. So so I would say, yes, I still hold out some radical hope for that. And I think the the only way to make that change would be based on some sort of financial, you know, mm -hmm. um, some some sort of financial yeah. process that would expand yeah. their, their So process. Rachel Douglas, uh, who likes your book very much, says, could you say something more about your process of unsilencing and how you are building on on Rolf Trio? Yeah, so um, part of what I also include in the in the introduction um, is that Trio talks about the different ways that we invoke history, right, um, and histoire, right, both the sort of creative. Um, fictional accounting of events, as well as the non-fictional, right, narratives about um, past events, right? And um, he goes through a, a fairly detailed and, and really thoughtful uh, examination of the different ways and, and of, of thinking about and engaging in, in history in its broadest um, conceptualizations, right? Fictional and non-fictional and everything in between. And so partly for me, it was important to recognize that there are a number of texts that have been written by historians and other scholars who dedicate a significant amount of time to um, descriptions and discussions regarding what white enslavers did how they did it, and how often they did it. And this includes rapes of enslaved women. And even though I certainly talk about rape, right, and, and sexual violence in the book, though it's not an extended um, narration of that, that for me, it was really important um, to decenter not only the Rollins family, but also the white enslavers um, at Rose Hall, right, in the 19th century and even before that, right? So it starts as a plantation in 1746 called True Friendship. That's the name of it at the time, early on. Um, and so part of the unsilencing of slavery for me in connection to what um, Trio presents is who, how do we center 
the narrators of history, right? Who who are we? Who are we utilizing for that lens or lenses of history? And that even that that the choices that we make about who serves as the primary um, person or persons in our in our narratives, right? Historical narratives is also very much in conversation with um, hierarchical aspects of power and domination. Um, and I would say not only in terms of sort of generally in our society, in our world, but also how elements of this too, of different power dynamics that are racialized, gendered and classed um, also permeate the academic world, also permeate the discipline of history, um, also are part of the decisions made about what's published and by whom, and especially who gets to be, you know, or who positions themselves as gatekeepers of Jamaican history, of slavery studies, right? Who are seen as the experts in this field, right? So for me, it was all of those elements that Trio talks about um, regarding whose stories are told, who gets to, who, who tells the stories, how are those presented? Um, and so all of that is actually in the mix for me in terms of the purpose of this book. So thank you for that question. Very as good. well as the one before too. Very, Very good. Uh, Frank, you would you un like to ask a question? You can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the, um, for, for well, when I, I heard about this thing from Steve, he sent around the notices. But what drew me to it was the name Rose Hall, right? I thought, well, that's strange because uh, I'm from Guyana and mm -hmm. we've got a Rose Hall plantation. But what yes. threw me more is when you mentioned Palmyra, because we've got a Palmyra as well, a few <laughs> villages down. And, you know, that really, uh, it shows me the, the, the lack of imagination of the colonizers. You go anywhere part of the Caribbean, you've got a Georgetown, you've got a Kingston, now you've got a, you've got the um, Rosa. Do you know, my question would be really is, um, do you know of, um, is there any links between the Rose Hall in Guyana and the Rose Hall in Jamaica, or maybe the Palmyra? Yeah, so also another great question. Um, I heard about, I have a, a, several, I shouldn't say a few, several Guyanese friends, and they had mentioned Rose Hall. They hadn't mentioned Palmyra though. Um, so that that I did not hear, but Rose Hall in Guyana. And, um, you know, certainly there are other Rose Halls and another name is Rose Hill. That's often referenced to, I'm not sure if Guyana has a Rose Hill, but certainly in Jamaica there is. Um, specifically for this plantation, uh, people often believe that it was named for Rosa Palmer, right? Who was uh, the first mistress uh, yeah. at Rose Hall, what would become Rose Hall. When she started there, it was true friendship. Um, but it's actually not named for Rosa. From what I can gather, um, it is actually named for the rose in the surname, right? The one of the um, popular surnames in the Palmer family, right? So even um, John Rose Palmer, right? That that is, it's about paying homage to the ancestors, to the family name, to the family itself, right? It certainly is possible that the name Rosa is in the mix as well, um, but it's a surname specific to the family that is being invoked. It is also possible, right, that there are connections to the Rose family in Guyana that I have not explored. Um, but I think, you know, it's like with some of, you know, when we think about even slave ships being named for friendship and freedom, right? Um, that, you know, Rose would not have been um, a, you know, it, would, it, it makes sense that that's also a popular, a, a popular name that could be used for plantations, just like the, you know, the names of slave ships could be freedom and liberty and, and all of that. Um, so I don't know in terms of whether there is a connection with the Rose Hall in Guyana, but I did know about the Guyana um, Rose Hall. And thank you for mentioning the Palmyra one. 
Okay. Uh, so that's something I'd actually like to look into as yeah. well. So thank you mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, we've all. Are they close that... together? Do you know? I'm just curious. Yes, the two of them are very close, but yeah. we've got the other one, which is Port Morant, which is further okay. down, and I know there's a Port Morant in, in Jamaica as well. Yes, yes, yes. 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 That's where the, the reason... slavery rebellion happened, didn't it? Yes. The reason why I asked if they were close together is that um, John Palmer. So when John Palmer um, got married to Rosa, right, um, and that was Rosa's fourth husband, by the way, um, when they got married, he was the owner of Palmyra. Uh, and you can actually see part of Palmyra when you're standing at Rose Hall today. Yeah. Um, and so there are a lot of records where you have... Uh, individual carpenters, for example, um, during the time that I'm looking at 1817 to 1832, leaving from Rose Hall to work on something at Palmyra, because both of those are then owned when yeah. Rosa Palmer passes, they're owned by John Palmer, and then later on, John Rose Palmer and Annie Palmer. Um, so yeah, that's so why I'm, I'm, I'm in close I'm, proximity. Um, Celia, I'm quite concerned. There are quite a lot of questions. Okay, uh, okay, sorry. Okay. There are quite a lot of more uh, questions. Yes. Well, that would be, yeah. Anyway, I won't comment on that last statement, but anyway, um, uh, so I'm going to combine a couple of questions because there are quite a few and there's somebody in the chat. So Abigail wants to know, uh, has the gov Jamaican government, forward slash, heritage representatives spoken to Rose Hall, meaning the Rollins family, I suppose, about addressing the imbalance of telling the enslaved person's story? That's one question. And Nadia says, related to that, will any of these insights into records be shared with the National Archives in Jamaica? So two questions. There okay. For. Thank you for, again, both of those those excellent questions. And thanks for mentioning the National Archives, because I, I want to um, say something about that. So um, as far as I know, the Jamaican government has not done that. And in fact, one of my um, uh, close family friends in Jamaica is trying to set up some meetings with me and the Ministry of Information, as well as, you know, some folks who work with tourism um, in order to not necessarily have more information at Rose Hall um, in the tours included, but to work with uh, schools in Jamaica, right? In Kingston, in Montego Bay. Um, it would be, I would be surprised if members of the Jamaican government, official members of the Jamaican government, try to in any way encourage or may pressure um, the Rollins family to make any of those changes just because of how much land and how, um, how much land they own in Jamaica. Um, and uh, the weight of their financial um, footprint in Jamaica as well, that they would they would not want to disturb the relationship that they have with them now and mm -hmm. their ongoing um, and expanding uh, property ownership in Jamaica. So that would be the first thing. I, I I could see them maybe mentioning that, but most, as Gad just mentioned as well, um, you know, even when I was talking with uh, uh, somebody, a close friend, another close friend whose um, daughter just graduated from UWE, and she was like, no, we are told about this as the history at UWE. <laughs> I was like, okay, because I'm worried, worried about the young children coming in who are seven, eight, and nine and not even thinking about so, um, you know, it's it's from the youngest to the eldest, right? And so I would just say that I, I, I just think it would be hard for them to have that conversation, official gov government um, employees. And at the same time, what I can do is meeting with folks there who are part of the government to see if we can do something in terms of the curriculum in schools, right? So that's the answer to the first. The second, in terms of the National Archives, um, when I was there in November, I actually visited the archives. I usually go by just to check on folks there. 
And um, I left them a copy of the book and I said, I'll send some more later as well. But what was disturbing to me was that the National Archives right now is closed in Spanish town, mm. right? And- um, Do we know why, by the way? Do we know why? I know it's closed. Yeah, so, the, so they've been closed since at least May, June, right, mm. of last year. Mm. And so when you enter, you can smell um, there, there's an odor that you smell, right? And so part of it is that the government, again, Ministry of Information, um, is not providing enough funding for them to continue and to take proper care of the materials. Yeah. Um, when I went in November and I was talking to to some of the, the archivists who I've worked with over the years, there was also the person who's the, the guard there who's been there for years as well. And my sister mentioned when the archivist was telling me, oh, yes, this and that. And I said, so no political aspects of it. She was like, well, and my sister said the guard just was rolling her eyes, rolling her eyes like, oh, yeah, it's that's in the mix because and later on, the archivist mentioned, um, you know, government officials believing that they're, you know, paid too much and that they're asking for too much. Um, so, but they are really concerned and, and I would like to, uh, Gad, maybe I'll talk to you about this later, you know, try to at least write, um, some letters or a petition, just encouraging the ministry of education, of in information to, to really support this, um, and to open the doors of the national archives again. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, they do. The national archives knows about this and, um, you know, at some point we had talked about me doing some kind of program there once the book was out and, and everything. Um, so I think once it's reopened, I'll I'll revisit those conversations as well. Um, right now, my interest is in getting it reopened again. Mm -hmm. you know? But they are well aware. And like I said, actually, they just sent me a letter recognizing the contribution and stuff. I just got that this week. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, just I'm not sure just uh, see, Joseph has a question. Joseph, if you yes, uh, yes uh, it's not yeah. Um, first of all, thank you, thank you, uh, Miss, for that stolen presentation. Um, just uh, just uh, to add, uh, and I see somebody put in the chat that there's a rose hall also in Saint Saint Vincent. I was going to say that, but we have a rose hill in Grenada. I'm calling from Grenada, and um, I'm, I want to ask you in terms of. How do you think about, what do you think about how archives are, are cared for in the Caribbean? For instance, mm -hmm. in 2010 or 2011, our archives have been closed because the library, it is attached to the National Library and the National Library have been closed because of their condition and the safety for workers. I think it's only now the new government is trying to do something about that. What can you say about the, the general state of archives that you have visited in the Caribbean, Jamaica included. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, you know, part of what's going on, you know, Jamaica is not exceptional, right? So thank you for the, the Rose Hall and the, the Rose Hill references in terms of Grenada and St. Vincent um, and the, you know, Rose Hill. So, you know, the, the owners, I should say, the property owners of Rose Hall and Rose Hill in, um, in, St. James and in other part, you know, Rose Hill in another, there are a couple of Rose Hills actually, are not the same um, property owner. So I, I should mention that. I don't know about um, Guyana, Grenada or St. Vincent in terms of the connections between those plantations. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, Jamaica is not uh, unique in the conditions right now of the National Archives, right? And there have been efforts by scholars, activists, um, artists uh, throughout the diaspora. So in the Caribbean, as well as outside um, to pay attention to this and to channel more resources to those archives, right? Um, and part of the work that's being done, though I don't think this replaces you know, the really supporting these archives. But part of the work that's being done relates to um, digitizing um, more and more of the archival records, right? So 
there is, for example, the Caribbean digital project that Alex Hill at Yale, Kayama Glover, um, formerly at Barnard, now at Yale, um, Vincent Brown and others have been actively engaged in. Uh, and part of that work is to figure out different strategies to essentially save some of these archives. And an aspect of that is increasing the digitizing processes of, of the materials that are in these archives right now. Um, so I say that, and you know, when I was visiting the archives in, in Spanish town, um, I actually thought that they had done a really excellent job over the years of organizing things, uh, materials, and also of um, really taking, you know, paying attention to and taking care of the materials, right? Mm -hmm. um, not only in terms of how they brought things out and the care that they asked us to as researchers, right, to take care of those items, Um but also just the information that they provide about, you know, this is the temperature in here for this reason. And, and most of the time it was, you know, you had to bring a sweater. It was that cold. Mm. Um, there were a couple of times where there wasn't. And then, you know, you just had to be careful because you'd just be perspiring over the documents. Mm. But, mm. you know, those archivists and other staff members are really committed to this. And it's not just a job, right? And there's nothing wrong with it being only a job, by the way, but it's not just a job. Um, and I don't think, again, they're exceptional in that regard. Um, and certainly, you know, I, the times that I visited the National Archives there um, was a very different experience for me, right? And I, I never developed any sort of relationships with the staff at the National Archives, right? Because I was dealing with different people at different times. Um, where I was able to make connections with the people in Jamaica. Um, and I would just say, I know we're going to move on, but that I think it's really, really important that if anybody is studying the region and really any region you're studying, that you cannot focus on archival documents that only exist and are housed outside of the region, right? That one must visit if you are studying Jamaica that at some point you actually have to visit Jamaica, right? And certainly work on their archives and look through their archives, right? Um, if that is something that is relevant and hopefully it would be to you and your work, right? So I think it's, it's also important not only to try to save these archives, but to, to make a statement and a very clear statement that one cannot study an area without ever visiting that area. Right. You cannot be an expert on Jamaica if you've never set foot on Jamaica. Right. So that that's my own additional thing. But um, let me stop there. OK, so we're, we're running out of time. Um, uh, I, we can't go through all the questions. I'm going to go through a few of them and see what we can get. Um, one is discussing what you've already discussed about unsilencing. So you talked about that. Another asks about what ways are the local community involved in shaping the narratives and representation at Rose Hall? Or how can their perspective be integrated? Um, oops, a, a, a further question. Uh, you, uh, Hilda says you, you, the practices you describe are negative, of course. Were there any positive, she means, at Rose Hall as well, like manumission uh, as a, a positive thing? Uh, Miranda on the website uh, has the project website, so she lists it. Uh, Haiti becomes a theme, and the people talk about that. Um, uh, um, yeah, given the resist, Jean says, given the resistance to change, uh, she was there 20 years ago. How do you see your work by begin to change that? Well, that's the answer is the website, probably, undoubtedly. Um, um, and and an important question I think is what advice do you have for someone who wants to better understand the lives of enslaved people if they don't have access to archive material from Jamaica well that's a good question too um, website you have talked about talks about that um, 
uh, Rupert uh, uh, asks, uh, he will bring the attention, bring your text to the attention of uh, Jamaica's National Council on Reparation. So that's an important point, I think. And uh, someone else says that uh, it's the same story at Nicholas Abbey. Um, uh, same problem, really. Um, and Henry talks about Whitney Plantation um, and uh, made me aware of how much our history is hidden and silenced so along the same lines. Um, and I think I think we'll stop there and see if you can deal with some of those in approximately two seconds. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> maybe one minute. So just quickly, local community, um, part of the second aspect of this project was actually um, for me to do a, an oral history um, of many of the descendants who still live in that area. And there's a church, Mount Zion, that I was going to sort of, you know, base um, some of that outreach at. Um, and so I'm still, I'm still considering that there, there are some, some issues I need to think through before I can do that. But I think it's really important to engage with, you know, people outside of um, the folks who who work at Rose Hall, right? The local folks who work there. Uh, so I'm trying to do that, and the website is is one of the ways to do that. In that, I hope that people who are descendants um, of the the persons that I am talking about at Rose Hall as enslaved, that they might find some information there that could help them piece together a little bit more of their familial um, and ancestral histories. Uh, just quickly in terms of the, um, you, you know, the positives. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure about the purpose of the question, but I would say that in, with the 208 people, that are highlighted in the Rose Hall uh, website, right? For and, and for me, it was really important that every single person, no matter how briefly they were mentioned in the records, right, um, had a space, right, on the website. And when you go to it, you'll see what I mean. But that um, there were no, of the 208 persons that I identified, no one was manumitted by the Palmers, right? People, there are a number who self-emancipated by running away, mm -hmm. right? So in the book, I talk about um, many of those instances. Um, and those are, you know, not all of them probably, but many of those are mentioned, right, in the journal itself. So I could try to track people as well, right? Um, and there are some enslaved persons who ran away um, 10, 15, 16 times, <laughs> right? One 16 times um, in five years, an enslaved woman, right? But so, you know, manumission, um, not in terms of this time period, 1817 to 1832, um, but... Um, certainly self-emancipation. Yes. Yes. Um, and the website, I'm just going to say, please visit the website. And, um, you know, somebody mentioned the National Council for Reparations um, and also CARICOM, right? If you haven't looked at the CARICOM plan for reparations, that that is a really important and how... Um, and, and really important for people to have a sense of the different processes that governments as well as um, countries, multiple countries are trying to be engaged in around the process and processes of reparations. Um, I think my project is part of that too. Mm, great. Well, Ru Rupert can help with that, I'm sure. Okay, good. Um, I, before I, before I, I thank Celia, and I'd like to if you stay on Celia anyway, have a chat. Uh, I just want to remind uh, people on the call that our next uh, webinar will, will will be on the 21st of February. Where, uh, Nicholas Prado will be discussing the foreign policy of uh, the Cuban president, Carlos Prio, which was 1948 to 52. That's the 21st of February. It'll be on, of course, the website. And I hope you will, will join us then. 
Uh, it remains for me to thank Celia for a terrific um, presentation. Um, I think the, the 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 chat. Steve will be able to keep the chat for you, so you'll see Please. the comments. I think that uh, Celia is a um, a wonderful communicator. So if you have um, uh, questions, I know that uh, Celia will respond. She's her her uh, emails available on the Barnard. Uh, website, I'm sure. Uh, and so she would respond if you have any further questions, judging from my vast experience with Celia, but it is pretty, pretty significant. Um, but yes, that was really great. And the comments uh, speak for themselves, so to speak. And um, thank you very much for doing that. And um, yeah. we, I look forward to chatting further with you. If you, you stay on a couple of minutes, that would be great. And just thank you all. I included my email uh, in the chat just now. Uh -huh. So please feel free to, uh, you know, just send me an email with your questions that I didn't get to, or even with your comments. Thanks for saving and sending the chat to me as well. Yeah. Um, and I just really appreciate you all being willing to be here today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. You have so a good rest end, of your we end it. We will end it there and uh, thank everyone for coming. And um, yeah. Oh, there's the, yes. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh -huh. That's the website. No, really? So we will, yes. Uh, no, that was, so we'll wait a minute while. Yes, yes. We'll wait just a second. Yeah. And... I think someone, I, I believe someone put the, there are two, it's the same website and eventually it'll just be one, but it has the same information. Uh -huh. um, so while we were working on it, we were using... <laughs> Rose Hall as part of it. And then as we got further into it, we decided to have it be on silencing slavery. So uh -huh. um, so that's why it's the same information though. Um, so uh -huh. one is Columbia, we use a Columbia website address and then the other one we don't. So thank you, thank you everybody. We're saying thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you'll um, see, yes, um, you'll see of course the, the questions and let's see once we, no, that's great. I, um, it's difficult for me because I'm a 20th century techie to do the questions and the comments and respond to the questions. Well, um, if you are, what am for, I? You know, that's <laughs> thank you for doing that. Though I would really like to to see the questions and comments. And yeah, I, yeah, you'll see there are a lot. Of I hope people will reach out. Um, in other presentations, people actually have. Um, there have been a few graduate students who are from Mobe um, who. Mm have really been interested in this because again, you know, the story that they have been told um, is the myth, right? And so it's opened their eyes about what yeah. really happened there. But, but, what, that's why the, I wrote it for people one, like that. Well, one yeah. of the interesting questions of course is, and you already, you've already already answered in the book in a way, but also in the presentation, we know so little about Annie Palmer actually herself, mm -hmm. don't we? I mean, there's almost nothing, is there? Yeah. And, you know, I I really wanted to include what we knew about her. Right. Um, though it wasn't going to be a chapter on her or the Palmer no. or anything like that. But um, in some ways, we know more about some of these other individuals like Dorinda, the midwife, than we know about Anthony Palmer. Right. Really strange. So there's that part of it, too. Um, I'm and trying to remember. Of course, I, I read it a while ago, but you know, I mean, this is all in Delicious' head, or did he make this all up? What I mean, yeah. So, think? so this is one of the things that I I had hoped that I would find Delisser's papers, yeah, right? of course, and yes, asked yes. and looked, and because you know, for decades he was the editor of the Jamaica Gleaner, right? I know for yeah. other pieces he's done all these other things, and I couldn't imagine, and so it's it's. Interesting, right? That um, I'm sure they're somewhere. I'm sure that, you know, uh, it's just that they're not public, right? And for whatever, whatever reasons for him or his family. Um, but that's what I'd like to get my hands on to, to get a sense of how he made some of these decisions. But what actually happened was that with Rosa Palmer and so many of her husbands dying, that that story and as far as we know, she did not kill those husbands. Um, but that story then becomes merged with Annie Palmer, 
right? And that, you know, it, it doesn't take that much of a creative leap to get from, you know, she's had multiple husbands to she killed those husbands and going from there, right? And then shifting to Annie Palmer, right? So I don't think, so that's part of it is the, um, and I, I didn't see anything in any of the records about Rosa Palmer being suspected of anything, right? I can't say definitively that, you know, that she might not have had a hand in any of that, but I, I don't have that information. Um, and from all that exists, it's that, you know, they they passed for different reasons. Yeah. Um, and she had four of them. And John Palmer was the last one. And then he went on and remarried after she passed. As you said in the book. Yes. One, yeah. one, one, 